Governor Ellis Daniels, a well-respected African-American leader, had long been aware of the systemic discrimination within law enforcement. Though his political platform included promises to address this issue, he felt that statistics and reports could only go so far. What he needed was undeniable proof, firsthand experience of how minorities were treated by the police on a daily basis. So he devised a daring plan. For one day, he would go undercover as an ordinary black man, dressed in simple, worn-out clothes, driving an old sedan through some of the city's most heavily patrolled areas. Ellis knew the risks were high. As the state's governor, his public image was critical, and such an operation could easily backfire. Only a handful of his most trusted security officials were in on the plan, monitoring from a distance but never intervening unless absolutely necessary. The goal was simple. Expose the day-to-day -day realities of racial profiling without relying on political filters or media coverage. If everything went according to plan, his findings would fuel his next major policy push, reforming the police department from within. As Ellis drove through the streets, he felt a mix of anticipation and anxiety. He had carefully chosen a neighborhood known for frequent stops of black and Latino drivers. The moment he crossed into the district, his heart raced. He didn't have to wait long. In his rearview mirror, he saw a patrol car close in behind him, its lights flashing. This was it. The test had begun. Ellis Daniels, sitting behind the wheel of his modest vehicle, could feel the tension rise as the police car approached. His disguise was carefully crafted to make him look like an average citizen. No trace of the well-groomed, polished leader that the public knew. He wore a simple cap pulled low over his eyes, old jeans, and a faded jacket. The plan was to blend in, to experience firsthand what so many black citizens had told him in town halls and community meetings, how they were disproportionately stopped, questioned, and often mistreated by law enforcement. The patrol car's lights flashed in his rearview mirror. He took a deep breath, reminding himself of the mission. As the police car pulled up behind him, he made sure to follow all protocols, keeping his hands visible and the engine off. His heart raced as he waited for the inevitable confrontation. The officer who emerged from the vehicle had a hardened look about him, one that Ellis had come to recognize in Veterans of the Force, someone who followed his instincts, often guided by ingrained biases rather than real suspicion. The officer approached cautiously, hand resting on his belt. Ellis kept calm, his training as a public figure kicking in. License and registration, the officer barked, his tone sharp and impatient. Ellis handed over the documents without hesitation. As the officer studied them, Ellis could sense the subtle shift in the air. He was being sized up, not for who he was, but for what he appeared to be, a black man in the wrong part of town. Ellis Daniels knew that the stop was no accident. His experiences as a politician had shown him the deep racial divide in the city, but nothing compared to living it personally. From the vantage point of his office, he had witnessed countless reports of minorities being disproportionately targeted by law enforcement. Yet from behind his desk, those were just statistics, cold numbers that painted a picture, but didn't convey the human cost. Now behind the wheel of his car, it was no longer just data, it was real, and he was living it. This wasn't a new issue. The city had a long history of racial tensions, rooted in economic disparities and systemic inequalities. Black neighborhoods were often over-policed, while wealthier, predominantly white areas saw little of the same scrutiny. Ellis had fought hard in the legislature for reform, but change was slow. Many on the police force, especially the older generation of officers, resisted the new training programs aimed at reducing racial profiling. The reality of the streets, they argued, didn't align with the theories taught in those classrooms. As Ellis sat there, waiting for the officer to return, he couldn't help but think of the countless men and women who had been in his exact position, stopped, questioned, and sometimes detained for no reason other than the color of their skin. This experiment wasn't just about policy anymore. It was personal. And as the officer finally approached his window again, Ellis knew that whatever happened next could be a turning point. Not just for his administration, but for the entire city. Watching from a distance, Ellis's security team grew increasingly uneasy. They were monitoring the situation from an unmarked van parked a few blocks away, equipped with high-tech surveillance gear. 
Each member of the team had been handpicked for their discretion and professionalism, but the tension was clear. They were used to protecting the governor from physical threats, not from the complexities of social experiments like this one. Every second that passed without intervention gnawed at their instincts to step in and take control of the situation. Should we pull him out? One of the agents whispered to the team leader. The leader, a seasoned professional named Cooper, shook his head, though his eyes never left the screen. Not yet, he said, though the tightness in his voice betrayed his own doubts. The governor had been adamant that they only intervene if absolutely necessary, but this situation was pushing the boundaries of their comfort zone. They had rehearsed various scenarios, but no one could have predicted how this would unfold in reality. Sir, as they watched the officer speak to Ellis through the car window, Cooper clenched his fists. He knew the officer was crossing a line. His posture, his tone. The tension was escalating, and Cooper could feel it. Keep the line open, he instructed one of the agents monitoring the audio. We need to be ready for anything. Despite the unease, they held their position, waiting for the governor's signal. This was his battle to fight, but how far would it go? The officer, Sergeant Bradley, was convinced something was off. As he examined the governor's license, he furrowed his brow. The name Ellis Daniels sparked a faint recognition, but it wasn't enough to dissuade him from his growing suspicion. To him, the man sitting in the old sedan didn't fit in with the neighborhood, and the instincts honed from years on the job were screaming at him that this was more than just a routine stop. He ran the information through the system but found nothing alarming, yet his gut told him otherwise. Returning to the car, Bradley leaned closer, his posture now more threatening. Where are you headed? He asked, his voice hard. Ellis remained calm, responding simply. Just heading home. The officer's eyes narrowed, scanning the interior of the car. This doesn't seem like your kind of place, he muttered under his breath, loud enough for Ellis to hear. The insinuation was clear. A black man in this neighborhood was automatically suspicious. Bradley's assumption, fueled by implicit bias, blinded him to the reality of who he was dealing with. Ellis knew the moment was pivotal. He could push back, reveal his identity, and put an end to this uncomfortable situation. But that wasn't the plan. He had to see it through. So he responded calmly, with the same patience he used in political debates. I don't see why that should matter, officer. Bradley's frustration grew. Something about this man didn't sit right with him, and he was determined to find out what it was. The stop was quickly turning into a confrontation, and neither man was willing to back down. As the seconds ticked by, the tension in the air thickened. A small crowd began to gather at a distance, some onlookers curious about the police activity, others with their phones out, recording the encounter. Ellis glanced around briefly, aware that this interaction was slowly turning into a public spectacle. He could feel the weight of eyes on him, but his mind remained focused on the objective. He needed to let the situation unfold, no matter how uncomfortable it became. Sergeant Bradley, noticing the attention, became even more agitated. The crowd only added to his sense of authority, and his behavior began to escalate. Step out of the car, he ordered, his hand now resting on the handle of his holstered weapon. Ellis hesitated for the first time, aware of how rapidly things were spiraling out of control. He had hoped this wouldn't escalate to this point, but it was clear that the officer was set on proving his suspicions, no matter how unfounded they were. Slowly, Ellis complied, stepping out of the car with his hands visible, a gesture of cooperation, but also a silent acknowledgement of the inherent danger black men face in such situations. The crowd murmured, sensing the tension, while Bradley, emboldened by his authority, moved closer. You got something to hide? He sneered, clearly trying to provoke a reaction. Ellis, keeping his voice steady, responded, No, officer, I just want to get home safely. But both men knew that safety was no longer guaranteed. Sergeant Bradley eyed Ellis with growing suspicion, his voice sharp. You sure you're just heading home? He asked, almost daring Ellis to contradict him. Ellis stood his ground, the calm exterior belying the rising tension he felt. Yes, officer, he replied, his voice even. I'm not doing anything wrong. Bradley leaned in, his voice dropping to a near whisper, filled with disdain. Men like you don't usually drive around here unless they're looking for trouble. Ellis stiffened, but he couldn't react the way most people in his position would have. He wasn't just any man being harassed, he was the governor. 
Is there a reason you stopped me, officer? Ellis asked, choosing his words carefully. His face remained neutral, but inside the weight of the situation pressed down harder with each word. He couldn't reveal his true identity. Not yet. Bradley sneered, looking him up and down. I don't need a reason. Something about you just doesn't sit right. He paused, then added, You've got a smart mouth for someone in your position. Ellis held his gaze, knowing the officer was pushing for a reaction. But this was exactly what he had prepared for. The kind of treatment that far too many black men experienced in their daily lives. Just trying to understand why I'm being treated this way, Ellis replied calmly, refusing to take the bait. The officer's arrogance hung in the air like a thick cloud, and the gathered onlookers continued to murmur among themselves, phones still raised to capture every moment. Ellis knew the situation was escalating in a way that could end badly if he wasn't careful. Yet this was the very essence of his experiment, to see how deep the racial bias ran and how far it could be pushed before it boiled over. Why are you so nervous, huh? Bradley pressed, moving closer, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. Got something in the car I need to know about? Maybe drugs? Weapons? Ellis's pulse quickened, but his training in public life had prepared him for this moment. He didn't flinch. No, officer, I've got nothing to hide. Just trying to get home. His calm, measured tone only seemed to agitate the sergeant further, who clearly wasn't used to this kind of restraint. Bradley huffed, now pacing slightly in front of the car. We'll see about that, he muttered. Maybe a quick search will clear this all up. Ellis knew he had to choose his next words carefully. A search without cause would be a clear violation of his rights, but pushing back too hard might turn this into something far worse. Officer, he said firmly, locking eyes with Bradley, unless you have probable cause, I'm going to have to refuse that search. At that moment, the quiet buzz of the crowd grew louder. More people had stopped, and several bystanders had begun live-streaming the interaction. Ellis could hear snippets of conversation, people wondering who he was, questioning why this officer was giving him such a hard time. The tension was palpable, the kind that could ignite at any moment if the wrong move was made. Bradley noticed the crowd too, his eyes flicking over the faces and the glowing screens pointed in their direction. The attention only fueled his irritation. Everyone thinks they're a lawyer these days, he muttered under his breath, loud enough for Ellis to hear. Let me tell you something. Probable cause isn't up to you to decide. He took a step closer, his face inches from Ellis's. Out here, I'm the law. Ellis held his ground, but the weight of the onlooker's gaze was beginning to change the dynamic. And the law says I have rights, just like anyone else, Ellis replied, his voice strong but not confrontational. He could feel the tide turning. The officer's bravado was starting to crack under the pressure of the watching crowd. You really want to do this in front of all these cameras? Ellis asked, raising his eyebrows. Bradley's jaw clenched, the crowd's silent judgment growing louder in his ears. Sergeant Bradley, visibly irritated by the mounting attention, took a step back and crossed his arms. Let me see your ID again, he snapped, as if the first check hadn't been enough. His eyes darted to the crowd before locking back on Ellis. And don't think this little show you're putting on will get you out of anything. Ellis, calm but calculating, pulled his wallet from his pocket and handed over his driver's license once more. I've already given it to you, officer, he said, his tone steady. He watched as Bradley examined the ID with exaggerated scrutiny, looking for any reason to justify the stop. The sergeant seemed to be grasping at straws, unwilling to let go of his assumption that something was amiss. Ellis Daniels, Bradley said slowly, as if testing the name on his tongue. He paused, the wheels turning in his mind. He glanced back at the crowd, noticing the growing number of phones recording every move. Suddenly he froze, his face twisting in confusion. Wait a minute. Recognition began to dawn on him, but it was too late. The wheels were already in motion, and the story was about to explode. As the seconds ticked by, the tension in the air became unbearable. Sergeant Bradley's initial bravado was beginning to crack, and the realization of his mistake was creeping in. Ellis Daniels wasn't just any black man, he was the governor. Bradley's eyes darted nervously between the ID in his hand and Ellis's calm, collected face. It was as if a switch had flipped in the officer's mind, 
but he was too deep into his act of authority to back down gracefully. The crowd sensed the shift in power, and murmurs of recognition started to ripple through the bystanders. Isn't that the governor? Someone whispered, and soon others were repeating it, their phones capturing every word. Bradley's face flushed red with embarrassment, but his pride wouldn't let him back off. Look, I don't care who you are, he said, his voice faltering slightly. If I say I need to search the car, I'm going to search it. Ellis stood firm, not budging an inch. Officer, you're making a big mistake, he said, his voice still calm but carrying a weight of authority. He knew the officer was teetering on the edge of a public humiliation that could destroy his career, and part of Ellis wanted to let it play out. But he also knew that the larger message, the systemic racism he was trying to expose, was more important than one man's pride. You can stop this now before it gets worse for you. Sergeant Bradley's frustration boiled over as the weight of his misjudgment pressed down on him. Stop what? He shot back, but his voice lacked the earlier confidence. You think you can just flash your title around and make this go away? His hands were shaking now, the pressure of the crowd and the unfolding spectacle too much to handle. The bystanders were no longer just passive observers. They were becoming vocal, questioning his authority, and that only made him angrier. Ellis, sensing that the moment had come, took a deep breath. I wasn't trying to flash my title around, officer, he began, but his words were deliberate now, aimed at diffusing the situation without further escalation. But since you brought it up, he stepped forward slightly, raising his voice so the crowd could hear clearly. My name is Ellis Daniels. I'm the governor of this state. The words hung in the air for a moment, sinking in like a slow-burning fuse. The murmurs in the crowd grew louder, and Bradley's face went pale. He staggered back, his mouth opening and closing, as if he were trying to find the right words to justify his actions. But there was no justification now. The truth had been laid bare, and with it, the full weight of his mistake. Sergeant Bradley stood frozen for a moment, the governor's words echoing in his ears. The realization hit him like a freight train. He had just stopped and harassed the most powerful man in the state. His eyes widened, and he took an involuntary step backward. Governor, he stammered, his voice barely audible. The murmurs in the crowd had turned into outright disbelief, and the phones were now capturing the full scale of Bradley's humiliation. Ellis remained calm, his expression neutral. Yes, I'm Governor Ellis Daniels, he repeated, his voice steady but carrying an unmistakable edge. The tension in the air was thick as Bradley's mind raced, searching for a way out of the mess he'd created. His hand hovered near his belt, but he knew there was no turning back now. Every move he made would be scrutinized. Every word could be his downfall. Bradley swallowed hard, his throat dry. He glanced nervously at the crowd, which was now buzzing with energy, the phones documenting his every move. I didn't, I didn't realize, he muttered, his confidence shattered. He took another step back, eyes darting toward his patrol car, as if contemplating retreat. But there was no escape. He was trapped, and the situation was spiraling out of control. We can sort this out, Bradley offered weakly, his voice cracking under the weight of his mistake. Before anyone could respond, sirens wailed in the distance, and within moments, more police cars arrived at the scene. The flashing blue and red lights only added to the spectacle. The news had spread fast. Reports of a governor being wrongfully stopped and mistreated by an officer were already trending online. The media frenzy was about to begin, and Bradley could feel the walls closing in. Reporters, alerted by the viral live streams, were already arriving on foot, pushing their way through the crowd, eager to capture the next explosive development. Ellis remained composed, but inside he knew this was exactly what he had feared. The situation had escalated far beyond a simple test of racial profiling. It was now a public relations nightmare for the entire police force. He looked around, noticing the news cameras closing in, reporters shouting questions, their microphones shoved toward him. Governor Daniels, what happened here? One of them yelled. Is this another case of police misconduct? Shouted another. Sergeant Bradley's face was now a mix of panic and disbelief, his hands shaking as he realized that the entire nation was about to witness his downfall. He tried to speak, but the words wouldn't come. His reputation, his career, everything was crumbling before him. He glanced toward Ellis, searching for mercy, 
but the governor's calm, unreadable expression offered no comfort. This wasn't just about him anymore. It was about something much bigger, and everyone knew it. As news of the incident spread like wildfire, the city erupted into protests. Crowds began to gather not just in front of the police station, but in key areas all over the city. People from every walk of life joined together, unified by their outrage at yet another case of racial profiling that had reached the highest office in the state. Signs with slogans like, Justice for All and End Racial Profiling Now filled the streets. The anger was palpable, and the city was on the brink of chaos. Ellis, though calm on the outside, felt the weight of the protests bearing down on him. He had hoped to keep this experiment controlled, but now it had spun out of his hands. He watched from his office as the peaceful demonstrations began to escalate, turning into clashes with law enforcement. Riot police were called in to control the crowds, but the people were no longer interested in being silenced. They were demanding justice and nothing less would suffice. Inside police headquarters, the pressure was mounting. Officers were split. Some defended Bradley, saying he had simply made a mistake, while others acknowledged the deep-rooted problem of racial bias within their ranks. The police chief, facing an overwhelming public backlash, called for an emergency press conference, but no one was sure what he could say to fix the damage. The entire city seemed to be holding its breath, waiting to see what would happen next. Inside the police department, the atmosphere was tense. Officers gathered in small groups, whispering about what had happened. Some were outraged that Sergeant Bradley had let things escalate to this point, while others were scrambling to cover up the incident, afraid of the damage it would do to the department's reputation. There was a sharp divide. Veteran officers sided with Bradley, claiming he was just doing his job, while younger recruits and minority officers saw this as an undeniable instance of racial profiling that needed to be addressed. Captain Howard, the head of internal affairs, paced nervously in his office. He had just finished watching the viral video of the governor's stop, and he knew the situation was far worse than he had initially thought. This wasn't just a case of an officer making a bad call. It was a public relations disaster with deep political implications. The entire department's credibility was on the line. He knew they had to act fast, but the department was torn between loyalty to one of their own and the demands for accountability from the public. We need a plan, Captain Howard muttered to himself, rubbing his temples. He picked up his phone and dialed the police chief, his voice tense. Chief, we can't wait. If we don't take immediate action, this is going to explode even more. We need to suspend Bradley and launch a formal investigation. Today, there was silence on the other end of the line, a hesitation that spoke volumes. The department was at a breaking point, and any wrong move could send it spiraling into chaos. Within hours, the internal investigation was launched. Sergeant Bradley was called into a meeting with Captain Howard and a group of senior officials. The tension in the room was palpable as Bradley sat down, his face pale. He hadn't slept since the incident, and it showed. Sergeant Bradley, Captain Howard began, his voice cold and professional. We have initiated a formal investigation into the events of yesterday's traffic stop involving Governor Ellis Daniels. Bradley's heart sank. I didn't know he was the governor, he said defensively, his hands clenching on the table. I was just doing my job. The guy looked suspicious, and I had a gut feeling something was off. Howard's expression remained stern. That's the problem, Sergeant. Your gut feeling led you to escalate a situation with no legal basis, and now the entire department is paying the price for your actions. As the questioning continued, Bradley could feel his career slipping away. The evidence against him was overwhelming. Footage from the crowd, reports from witnesses, and even his own body camera, which captured the tension and growing hostility in his tone. He knew he had crossed the line, but admitting it felt like signing his own professional death warrant. The walls were closing in, and for the first time, Bradley realized that there might be no way out of this. Meanwhile, Governor Ellis Daniels had called an emergency meeting with his top advisors and legal team. The protests had grown in intensity, and the pressure to make a public statement was immense. Ellis, though calm on the surface, was deeply troubled by the way things had spiraled. His undercover mission had revealed more than just racial bias in the police force. It had sparked a firestorm that was now threatening to destabilize the entire city. Governor, the people are demanding action, his chief of staff, Carla Jenkins, said urgently. 
We can't stay silent any longer. We need to address the public and reassure them that reforms are coming. Ellis nodded slowly, but his mind was elsewhere. He knew that this was about more than just calming the protests. This was a moment of reckoning, a chance to finally bring about the reforms he had been fighting for his entire career. But how far could he push without losing control of the situation? We need to be strategic, Ellis said after a long pause. This isn't just about responding to the protests. It's about changing the entire system. I want a full review of the police department's practices. Every officer, every policy, everything needs to be on the table. His advisors exchanged glances, realizing that the governor was planning something far bigger than a simple press statement. This was the beginning of a major overhaul, and no one knew where it would end. Sergeant Bradley left the meeting room feeling the weight of the investigation crushing him. His colleagues avoided eye contact as he passed them in the hallway. His mind raced as he tried to find a way to salvage his career. But deep down, he knew the damage was irreparable. The viral videos, the governor's calm yet damning public presence, everything had spiraled out of control. He reached his desk, slumping into the chair, his hands shaking. His phone buzzed incessantly with messages, most from friends in the department offering their support. But there were a few hateful messages, accusing him of being the face of everything wrong with the police force. Bradley's chest tightened. He had never thought of himself as a racist, just a cop doing his job. But now he was being painted as the symbol of racial injustice in America. Staring at his phone, Bradley realized that his life as he knew it was over. The department was under pressure, and someone would have to take the fall. He knew it would be him. Maybe I deserve this, he muttered to himself, but the bitter taste of regret lingered. Everything he'd built was unraveling in front of his eyes, and for the first time, he truly felt the consequences of his actions. That evening, Governor Ellis Daniels stepped in front of the cameras to address the state. The city was on edge, the protests growing louder by the hour. As the camera lights flashed and microphones were thrust toward him, Ellis took a deep breath. This was the moment he had been waiting for, his chance to demand real change. Good evening, he began, his voice steady and calm. What happened to me during that traffic stop should never happen to anyone, regardless of their race, background, or position in society. But the truth is, for many black men and women in this state and across the country, this is an everyday reality and that is unacceptable. The crowd gathered outside the governor's mansion, fell silent as Ellis continued. Today, I am calling for a comprehensive review of all policing practices in our state. We will be forming an independent commission to investigate cases of racial profiling, excessive use of force, and any systemic issues that allow these abuses to continue unchecked. This is not just about one officer or one incident. This is about creating a police force that serves and protects all of our citizens equally. The speech hit like a thunderbolt. The crowd erupted in applause, and within moments the news networks were buzzing with headlines. Ellis had turned the incident into a rallying cry for change. But as he stepped away from the podium, he knew the road ahead would be long and filled with resistance. Reforming the system was only the beginning. As the Independent Commission began its investigation, the depth of the problem became painfully clear. Files were opened, statistics analyzed, and interviews conducted. What emerged was a pattern of systemic discrimination that ran through every level of the police department. Black and Latino drivers were far more likely to be stopped, searched, and arrested than their white counterparts. And the disparities only deepened when it came to cases of excessive force. Reports of racial profiling had been buried for years, ignored by senior officers who had turned a blind eye to the misconduct of their subordinates. As the evidence mounted, the commission began to uncover something even more alarming, an unofficial code of silence among the force, where officers protected each other from scrutiny, even in cases of clear misconduct. The findings shocked the public, but to Ellis Daniels, it was a confirmation of everything he had suspected. The problem was far more entrenched than anyone had imagined. Reform would not be easy, and the police department was already pushing back. We can't just overhaul everything overnight, the police union argued, but Ellis knew that change was non-negotiable. This was the battle of his career, and he wasn't backing down. Sergeant Bradley sat alone in his apartment, the weight of the world pressing down on him, 
The suspension from the force had come swiftly, and the investigation was moving faster than he could process. The headlines were merciless, labeling him as a symbol of everything wrong with the police. His face was everywhere, on the news, social media, and the front pages of major newspapers. He had become the villain in a story that had spiraled far beyond his control. As he stared at the empty walls of his living room, Bradley couldn't escape the nagging feeling that something deeper was at play. His entire career had been built on gut instincts and an us-versus-them mentality that had been instilled in him from his first day on the force. He had always believed he was doing the right thing, but now, faced with the truth, he wasn't so sure. Was I really just doing my job, or have I been part of the problem all along? He muttered to himself, his voice tinged with regret. The more he thought about it, the more he realized how blind he had been. His actions during the stop had been based on assumptions, assumptions that a black man driving through a certain neighborhood had to be up to no good. The realization gnawed at him. He had ruined his own life, but worse, he had contributed to a system that oppressed people like Governor Daniels every day. And now it was too late to take it all back. Despite the chaos that had erupted in the city, Governor Ellis Daniels couldn't shake the thought of Sergeant Bradley. The man had been the catalyst for everything that had unfolded, but Ellis knew that focusing solely on punishing him wouldn't solve the deeper issue. Reform wasn't just about calling out individual officers. It was about changing the entire culture of policing. With that in mind, Ellis made a bold decision. He would offer Bradley a chance at redemption. After arranging a private meeting, Ellis sat across from Bradley in a small conference room at the governor's mansion. The officer looked broken, defeated. His usual bravado had been stripped away, leaving only the man beneath, a man who now seemed to be grappling with the weight of his actions. Sergeant Bradley, Ellis began, his voice calm but firm. You and I both know what happened during that stop. You made assumptions based on my skin color, and it escalated into something it never should have. Bradley nodded, his eyes downcast. I was wrong, Governor, he said quietly. I let my biases get the better of me. I, I'm sorry. Ellis studied him for a moment, sensing the sincerity in his words. I'm not here for an apology, the governor replied. I'm here to offer you a chance to be part of the solution. The changes we need to make can't happen without people like you, the ones who are willing to admit their mistakes and work to fix them. So what do you say? Are you ready to help rebuild trust between the police and the community? News of Ellis's meeting with Bradley spread quickly, sparking a heated debate across the state. Some hailed the governor's decision as a wise move, an opportunity to turn a symbol of racial profiling into an advocate for reform. Others, however, were furious, arguing that Bradley should face the full consequences of his actions without the possibility of redemption. How can we trust someone who's been part of the problem for so long? One protester shouted during a televised interview. The debate took over social media with hashtags like Chasha Justice for All and Asher No Second Chances trending as people took sides. Talk shows and news segments featured heated arguments between those who believed in forgiveness and those who thought Bradley should be made an example of. The police union also entered the fray, defending Bradley as a man who had made a mistake, but who had served his community for years with distinction. Ellis, watching the uproar unfold, knew that no matter what decision he made, it would divide the public. But to him, this wasn't just about one man. It was about setting the stage for real, lasting reform. People deserve a second chance, he told his advisors, but they also need to earn it. Bradley will have to prove he's willing to change, just like the entire police department. The road ahead was uncertain, but Ellis was determined to guide the city through it. Governor Ellis Daniels' decision to offer Sergeant Bradley a second chance marked a turning point, not just for the officer, but for the entire police force. Ellis knew that true reform required more than punishing a single individual. It demanded systemic change. In response, he initiated a series of reforms aimed at tackling the root causes of racial bias within the police department. These included mandatory anti-bias training, stricter oversight on traffic stops, and a review of all officers with past complaints of racial profiling. The governor also introduced a community-based policing initiative, which sought to build trust between officers and the neighborhoods they serve. 
Instead of patrolling with a mindset of control and enforcement, officers would now be trained to act as partners with the communities, ensuring safety through collaboration. To enforce these changes, Ellis appointed a civilian oversight board made up of respected community leaders tasked with monitoring the police and ensuring accountability. As these reforms rolled out, tension within the police force began to rise. Many veteran officers resisted the changes, viewing them as an attack on their autonomy and experience. Meanwhile, younger officers and recruits, those who had entered the force with idealism and a desire for change, embraced the reforms. The department found itself at a crossroads, and the conflict within its ranks threatened to undermine the progress being made. With the nation watching, Ellis Daniels knew the time had come to address the growing tension in the city and within the police force. The governor scheduled a public address, one that would not only speak to the immediate situation, but lay the foundation for his broader vision of justice and equality. Standing at the podium, with the weight of the moment heavy on his shoulders, Ellis looked out at the sea of faces, supporters, critics, and everyone in between. My fellow citizens, Ellis began, his voice calm but resolute, the events of the past few weeks have exposed deep wounds in our community, wounds that have been left untreated for far too long. What happened to me should never happen to anyone, but we must remember, this is not about a single officer, nor is it about one incident. This is about a system that has allowed racial injustice to persist in every corner of our society. He paused, letting the words sink in. The crowd was silent, hanging on every word. Change will not come easily, he continued, but it is necessary. We will reform our police force, not to weaken it, but to strengthen the bond between those who protect and those who are protected. This is not just about policy, it's about trust, and trust must be earned. His speech, filled with both hope and a firm call for accountability, resonated deeply with the public. It was clear, this was more than just a political moment. It was a turning point in the fight for equality. As Governor Daniels' reforms took root, the internal culture of the police department began to shift, but not without resistance. Some officers, particularly the older generation, bristled at the new oversight measures and community-oriented focus. They saw the changes as a challenge to their authority and experience, believing that the governor's policies were more about appeasing political pressures than about real safety. Sergeant Bradley, who had become the unlikely face of the reform efforts, found himself caught in the middle of the conflict. Now reinstated after agreeing to undergo extensive retraining, Bradley faced a department that viewed him with suspicion. To some, he was a traitor who had caved under pressure. To others, he was a symbol of the old guard struggling to adapt. But Bradley had changed. His experience with Governor Daniels had forced him to confront his biases, and he was determined to prove that he could be part of the solution. In the field, Bradley began to apply the lessons he had learned. He made a conscious effort to connect with the community, to listen rather than assume, and to treat every interaction as an opportunity to build trust. It wasn't easy, and many of his colleagues were slow to follow his lead. But over time, the impact of the governor's reforms started to show. Neighborhoods that had once been wary of the police began to engage more openly, and the lines between authority and community started to blur in ways no one had expected. Sergeant Bradley's journey toward redemption was not a quick one, nor was it without setbacks. Every day he faced the consequences of his past actions, from the mistrust of the community to the judgment of his fellow officers. Yet he pushed forward, determined to make amends. He volunteered to speak at community meetings, sharing his own story of bias and the lessons he had learned. Slowly but surely, people began to listen. It wasn't immediate. But over time, the community began to see Bradley not just as the officer who had wrongfully stopped the governor, but as a man who was genuinely trying to change. One of his most significant moments came during a tense situation in one of the city's most volatile neighborhoods. A young black man had been wrongly accused of theft, and tensions between the police and the community were on the verge of boiling over. Bradley, now trained in de-escalation tactics, stepped in and instead of asserting control, began to talk to the crowd, asking questions, listening to their frustrations. The situation, which could have ended in violence, was peacefully resolved. News of Bradley's actions spread quickly. It was a small victory, but one that marked a turning point in his relationship with the community. 
For the first time since the incident with the governor, he felt as though he was truly making a difference. Redemption was not about erasing the past, he realized. It was about learning from it and working every day to be better. As Governor Daniels' reforms began to take hold across the state, the landscape of policing slowly started to change. Departments that had once resisted the shift toward community-based policing began to see the benefits. Crime rates in certain areas started to drop, not because of increased patrols, but because of increased trust between officers and the people they served. The Oversight Board kept a close eye on every department, ensuring that policies were followed and that instances of misconduct were swiftly addressed. For Ellis, it was a vindication of everything he had fought for. The changes he had implemented were making a tangible difference, and though there was still much work to be done, the tide was turning. Communities that had long been estranged from the police were starting to re-engage, and the officers who had embraced the reforms were becoming local heroes in their own right. The trust that had been broken was slowly being rebuilt, one small step at a time. Bradley, now fully committed to his new role, continued to be a symbol of the possibility of change. He wasn't perfect, and he knew that the path to true redemption was a long one, but he was walking it day by day. Alongside him, other officers who had once been skeptical of the reforms began to see the value in the governor's vision. A new era of policing was dawning, one where justice and accountability were no longer just ideals, but practices embedded in the daily work of protecting and serving. The events that had started with a simple traffic stop had transformed into something far greater. What began as a moment of injustice had evolved into a movement that was reshaping the entire state. Governor Daniels had used his platform not only to expose the flaws in the system, but to drive the changes needed to fix them. The road ahead was still long and there were no guarantees, but for the first time in years, there was a real sense of hope that things could be different. For Sergeant Bradley, the journey was far from over. He had learned that redemption wasn't a destination, but a process, one that required constant reflection and effort. He had lost his reputation, but gained something far more valuable a chance to make a real difference. As he looked out over the city he had sworn to protect, Bradley felt a renewed sense of purpose. He wasn't just a cop anymore. He was part of a larger mission, one dedicated to creating a future where everyone, regardless of their race, could feel safe and respected. As the sun set on the city, casting long shadows over the streets, Ellis Daniels stood at his office window, watching the people below. He had taken a risk, but it had paid off. The protests had quieted, the reforms were in motion, and the future, though uncertain, seemed brighter than ever. We're not there yet, he whispered to himself, but we're on the way.